Hi, it's uh, JJ Abrams. It is a pleasure to be here uh, talking to the director of Minati, uh, Lee Isaac Chung, and the star of the film, Stephen Young. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure so to much, talk JJ. to you. <laughs> um, I can't tell you how much I love this movie. Um, it's rare to see a film that is so involving and almost hypnotic uh, in its, uh, its subject matter and still as funny and as unexpected and colorful and suspenseful uh, and beautifully done. And I just cannot thank you enough for the work that you and your amazing cast and crew uh, have done to, to put this together. So it's a real thrill to be here and to get to talk to you about it. Um, I just wanted to start with, with Isaac, just asking sort of how you came to uh, decide that this was a story you wanted to tell. I know it's, it's sort of a bit of a departure from your other stuff. And, and I'm just curious what made you decide to tell this story and, and now. Uh, sure. Uh, th thanks for that intro, by the way. That, that really means a lot coming from you. Um, we, yeah, so, so for, for myself, I've, um, I kind of took a break from filmmaking for a few years after my daughter was born. And uh, I was just trying to wrap my head around like the, the types of films that I might want to make um, moving forward. And um, it was around the time that my daughter reached the age of the, the character of David, who you see in the film that I was kind of seeing things through her point of view more uh, and remembering what it's like to be her age when we were moving to Arkansas. Mm -hmm. um, and I also read this book uh, by Willa Cather um, called My Antonia in which she talks, she, she writes a story about growing up on a farm in Nebraska. And she had mentioned this quote about just how much her work took off once she started to really remember rather than just admire, like admire other writers. Um, and I, I kind of felt like maybe I was doing that in my own work and I felt inspired to sit back and try to remember what it was like uh, to be a child and to create something that I could even leave behind for my daughter. And, and that's basically the genesis of this project. I started off just jotting down a bunch of memories. I had about like 80 memories. Um, and, and looking at them, I could see the semblance of a story, like this family shows up because the dad uh, takes this family and just plops them on this piece of land in the middle of nowhere. And then uh, by the end, you know, there's a fire and, and there's also a patch of Minari uh, that seems to grow. The only thing that seems to really last on this farm. Um, so I kind of felt there's this interesting through line of a story and I just needed to figure out how to put all the memories in the proper place to make this um, work as a story. Wow, so so you, you you literally went out and and you just sort of went fishing and sort of put all these these memories out there and that the story sort of revealed itself based on these disparate memories and ideas. Yeah, basically, I mean, I, I kind of saw the semblance of something. Right. Uh, but, you know, in terms of all the beats and dramatic beats and things like that, uh, that took a lot of hammering and, and that took a lot of figuring out. But at least there were certain things that I knew um, could be quite interesting, like uh, the grandmother coming at a certain point and uh, bringing this freshness and new energy to the story. And, um, you know, the, the character played by Will Patton is, is a real guy in, in my life. And, and I just thought, you know, he's an interesting guy. He needs to be in a movie, someone like that. Um, so there were just these little elements that I just knew would cinematically be pretty interesting for a story. Uh, and, and, and then how did you go from that idea or even the script, which I'm assuming you, you, you had by the time you went to go and try to practically get the film made, but how did you get the film made from that idea to actual execution? Um, yeah, so, I mean, at the time, this is, this is great that this is a, a screening for CIA and, and a, a great platform for this. Um, I, I wasn't represented at the time. I had a friend who, who's an agent at CIA, uh, Christina Chow, and I, I, I showed her the script and I wasn't sure like what would happen from it. Um, and she really liked it and she, she wanted to take it on. And, and um, she was so instrumental in getting this film made. She essentially brought uh, plan B to the table and Steven as well. Um, and from there, um, that was in late 2018 and early 2019, we went into production by July 
of, of that same year. So it was just uh, an incredible rush. It was, it was really fast. Um, and less than one year uh, from that point, we had a finished film. Um, so I felt like once this story was written, it just felt like life kind of changed really quickly. Well, one of the things that I think uh, is so profound about the movie is just how effortless you make it look. And I, I know, like you say, it's a lot of hammering and uh, a lot of a lot of work to make it look so effortless. But it just really it it the fluidity of it and the naturalism of it is so um, it's really affecting. And and obviously the performances have a lot to do with that. Stephen, I think you know you're so uh, you're so wonderful in the movie and and. Thank you. you know the the experience watching it is you know I I I'm so in your shoes and I'm just curious like what the challenges you faced playing Jacob are there parts that felt familiar to you um, it was just such a wonderful performance. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, I mean, there were so many challenges for this internally. I think um, I think Isaac wrote something so honest that it actually allowed for. Um, it allowed space for me to imbue um, my understandings of, you know, my father from that generation. I don't think Isaac was explicitly saying play my father. He was just kind of talking about this concept at large of just a uh, Korean American immigrant man and what that, what that means and why a person like that exists and why the person makes those types of choices. Um, I think what was hard to grasp at the time was I needed to break through a lot of the walls of, of maybe the gazes that are particularly on a character such as this. Um, mm -hmm. I think the American gaze has upon it um, maybe a framework of, uh, uh, and it's not the larger American gaze per se, it's actually the internalized American gaze, gaze for myself even as a Korean American person was, mm -hmm. I remember my parents through the understanding of who they are from the Americana that's kind of indoctrinated into me. So mm -hmm. I look at them as people who can't speak the language and there's a little bit of shame there, or there's, there are people that like didn't allow me to feel like fully part of this country because they couldn't come with me or uh, I felt separated from them. And so I could only see them in a specific light and I needed to break through a lot of those barriers in addition to, you know, what I felt like potentially you could be upholding or speaking to a larger community. I had to kind of like touch those things and then dismantle them because ultimately we were just in service of Jacob, of the singular person, Jacob. And um, when I came to that realization, it was really wonderful because then I was able to see that, you know, not only that. Um, Jacob is his own person and that I could play Jacob, but also that I am my father, you know, I am my father. I, I, and I think that's a human thing that everybody can relate to of just the understanding between generations. And I think that was a real difficult work um, because from my standpoint as an immigrant um, and my connection to my parents, there was a lot of love there, but there was not a lot of spoken love of, of just understanding past back and forth. We didn't have the communication at hand to kind of like talk about it, those granular levels. Um, and then also like, there's a lot of trauma from his reality that he has, that he holds with him that he can't talk about. Um, and so to bridge that gap was gnarly, um, beautiful, um, and then ultimately, like what was really great was the final feeling that I had that allowed me to kind of just give in to uh, Isaac's honest narrative was he wrote something again so honest that it felt like faithful. It really felt like, mm -hmm. oh, cool, I can just be faithful to this story. And if I submit to that, then it will make itself in some way. That's awesome. Um what it means to be an, an immigrant in this country uh, has certainly in the last four years been under attack and questioned and uh, made, I think, um, it, it's this film so specifies and, 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 and humanizes these characters and 
it does that thing that I think is so invaluable, which is it just shows the commonality that we all have and 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 a specific may be different, but our lives are so uh, intertwined and, and similar in so many ways. And I'm just curious, Isaac, for you first, telling this story, you know, clearly you wrote and, and then produced this film um, in within this period of time, how much of that was sort of a conscious decision to comment on that? Uh, clearly it's inherent in the DNA of the story, but I just didn't know. I just think one of the beautiful byproducts of this amazing film is you're put into other people's shoes and it's one of the most powerful and profound things that a film can do. And I just didn't know how much of that, not to say that this is a political statement at all, but mm. I was curious how much of that mattered to you in the telling of the story. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's a great question because it it did matter a great deal. Um, I, I didn't want it to be a political piece, if that makes sense, as a film, sure. but the way that it works and the way that an audience can engage with it, I wanted that to to feel as though like it's a, a, a new way for an audience to think about immigrants or to think about, um, you know, the American dream or, or farming, uh, various things, like to show a portrayal that maybe we haven't been seeing um, as, as an Asian American, I feel like often we're so closed in by this idea that we have to explain ourselves to to a white audience, or, or that with immigrants, you you almost have to justify why they are there and why we're seeing about the, seeing them or what we're learning about them. Um, but to what Stephen was saying before. Um, the idea, the underlying drive with this film was just to show human beings. Um, and, and I feel like that in itself can be something quite political. That can be a political act just to um, remove the categories, remove those, some of those ideologies that, that frame you know, the way we talk about people and just to show people as people. Um, and, and so that was a big drive for me and, and something that um, has been so moving for me as we show this film around is just how people of all different walks of life seem to connect with it. Like, that, that's been just tremendous and, and really um, has been almost like the ultimate payoff of this film, just to see uh, different people coming up and telling me about their grandmothers and they might have lived a completely different life than I have, but you know, they, they still feel like these characters were their own family. And, and that's Stephen, tremendous, it's just been amazing. Mm. That's great. Stephen, anything that you wanted to add in, in, in that regard? Yeah, I mean, uh, everything that Isaac said, I think we were just trying to get to a humanity I think I think the explanation part of it is the trickiest part because um, in some ways, like I was saying before, like the gaze is internalized within us too. And I think, um, you know, Boots said this best to me and we were talking about it and I and he, he's so good at putting things into words, Boots Riley, um, that I couldn't like manifest into words, but he said, the conversation around essentialized authenticity often gets in the way of seeing how and who we actually are. And I think what that's saying is sometimes we as this kind of middle, in, caught in between two worlds um, community, which are immigrants, um, this third culture, these third culture kids like Isaac and I are, um, we oftentimes are tasked by the American gaze to engage in an authentic rendering of our culture from another place. But the truth is, is we don't have access to that at that level right. because we're us right here. Right. And I think, and then on the other end, we're, we have also the Korean gaze placed upon us or our motherland's gaze placed upon us to, you know, we're, we're seen as American. And so this dissonance, I think, creates this weird place where we are trying to authenticate our, 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 ourselves in a, like a polarized vacuum where it's either American or, or Korean. And it's, the truth is, is like, we wanted to just say what we are right here. And mm -hmm. this is who we are. And this is valid enough that we don't need to be made by the framework of these nations, but like we are our own unique thing within the construct of America. And that is uniquely American. The American dream is to be able to make your own life. It isn't just get rich quick. It's mm -hmm. make your own life and the freedom to like be you and like say and, and live and die by your own choices. And um, that's, I think, 
the, the, the core thing that we were trying to get at, which was mm -hmm. this itch that we have that we don't feel validated by Parasite per se. As wonderful as that is, we don't feel completely validated by that. And in that same way, we're not completely validated by, you know, a, a, a Terrence Malick amazing, like, you know, film about the, the, you know, instead, like there's something about this experience that we dove into that validates us on all ends. But then what's great is that in saying it so honest and true um, to our experience, we get to connect with everybody. Then people get to see the intrinsic humanity that we all share. And that was the most important thing for us. That's excellent. Um, you mentioned Parasite and obviously to see, you know, the universality of that film and what director Bong did with that. And um, it reminds me when we did, you know, Lost years ago and we had a Korean couple, Yoon Jin Kim and Daniel Day Kim mm -hmm. in the show. And, and I remember we had an early episode that was mostly in Korean and we thought, oh, this is gonna, people are gonna have, they're gonna get letters. Not one, not nothing. Like, and, and it became some of people's favorite storylines because they just connected with the people and, and the language mm -hmm. had nothing to do with it. I know you've done it before, but I was curious for you, Stephen, what it was like acting in an American film in Korean. Um, well, that was the trippiest part. I think, you know, going to Korea and acting in a Korean film is one other thing where I'm really just wrestling with maybe the Korean gaze upon myself. And so with Burning that I got to do, I just accepted who I am as an American and then played within that framework. But this one was so caught in between that um, it was really kind of a profound experience where I realized that like I needed to bet it kind of just on ourselves. I think before I could lean on like a, like an entire system to like give me a little confidence to be like, well, you know, I know, I know a little bit about Korea, but I'm also so deeply American to go work over there. Like I can hold on to my Americanness and like be here without feeling like I'm doing something wrong. And then in the other end here, you know, I, I know my Koreanness and I can hold on to that so that I don't feel burned by the American system and how it wants to see me. But this one was like both sides are in some ways like crossing and then diagramming me. And so it was this little sliver that was left over of just like who I am. And I think we all kind of bonded with that. You know, I think Isaac and I talked about it a lot, Doug. Um, Christina O, oh, Christina Chow, all these people that were Korean American, just kind of like our own third culture thing, we would just really connect here, and it really and we and, and it really felt like we made it all together in that in that same kind of feeling. Just yeah, caught it helped. There. It helped that we were in the it, we were in <clears throat> Tulsa, kind of on our own, and um, we had this house where we would hang out a lot, and it felt mm -hmm. like we were isolated in many ways, and somehow. It, it gave us that chance to create our own identity and reality in that space, mm -hmm. which is really great. Can, can you talk a little bit more about that, about shooting in Tulsa and what that summer was was like? Yeah, I mean, it was a it was a fast shoot. So we, we had 25 days. Um, and as I mentioned, we didn't have that much prep because we we really raced to, to go into production. Um, and Let's see, we, working with Alan, who is uh, Alan Kim, who is seven at the time, mm. we could only do about like six hours on set with him. And he's in <laughs> almost every scene. So um, it was, I just remember being really stressed for like really intense short working hours and then uh, lots of time unwinding together over Korean meals um, that, that a, a wonderful <laughs> friend of ours was cooking mm. for us. Um, That's fantastic. And, but but it was it was great. It was really hot. It was, it was super hot. Um, and uh, it, uh, one one aspect that I should share, we had a lot of local crew from Tulsa, um, and a lot of those guys they kind of grew up the way I grew up in Arkansas. Like mm -hmm. they came from the countryside. So in a way, I felt like I was bonding with all the Korean Americans on one side of the production, and then also all these guys who went fishing and hunting and all the things that I did as a kid who would tell me, oh, you know, in the script, I like that part where he tries to dip for the first time. I remember when I tried dip for the first time, you know? Uh, so so it, was, it was a nice place to be working between those two worlds. Um, what was really about cool. two hours oh. away from, from where I actually grew up. Sorry, I was, I, 
What was really cool about what you're saying though, Isaac, too, was like at the beginning of the production, there was this hesitant feeling of like making sure that we respected each other. And I think people were like trying to, I think maybe the predominantly white crew was not trying to like profess or like engage in 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 what we were talking about, thinking that it was a very delicate thing, but and and maybe the Korean side as well in in, in some ways and with the way that they were interacting with the Americana of it all. But then by the time we got to the end of the experience, it felt like everyone realized that we made something deeply human together that like transcended all these things because we didn't create barriers for entry for anyone. It was just, we're talking about like being people and being human beings. Oh, for and, sure. uh, yeah. that, was, that was really wonderful feeling by the end of it. Like mm -hmm. it, was, it was awesome. Uh we have to talk about the rest of the cast too, because uh, the casting of this film is incredible. Um, and uh, Yoo Jung Yoon and, and Yeri Han are, are both celebrated actresses uh, in Korea. I just love to know how they became involved in this. And I mean, they are so great. Uh, obviously um, the grandmother is such a, a, a powerful character and so unexpected and, you know, the, the scene in the church. I mean, there are just, there are moments where you're just like, it just kills you. It's it, like, she is so good. Just curious what your experience working with them was and, and how you got them involved. Um, yeah, the, the friend I mentioned who was cooking meals for us in Tulsa, uh, she's, she's a producer in Korea. Her name's Ina Lee. And uh, I, I was living in Korea at the time when I had finished the script. And um, she basically introduced me to both actresses um, I, I had already known of Yoon Yeo Jung's work because because she's you know I, I was already a huge fan of hers, um, mm. but she was the go between for us and and we met together in Korea a number of times and um, a lot of those ideas in the script I mean she came up with wonderful surprising elements on her own so I just knew she'd be perfect for it like putting the chestnut in her mouth and then offering it to David that's something that she she came up with um, so good. Yeah, yeah, it's one of my favorite moments now. Yeah. Um, and, and she's just kind of like that as a person, you know, she's very, she's down to earth and she's always, she'll, she'll easily profane anything that, that you're talking about. But um, at the same time, there's a deep tenderness and humanness to her, uh, this, uh, to Yoon Yeo Jung. And uh, Yeri, I mean, she just has such depth in, in who she is as a person. And um, you can see it in all the roles that she's done. She could be doing very little, but there's just so much depth to whatever she's doing. So I just knew they'd be they'd be just right for the part. Um, and the whole thing of casting was like, I felt like in a way this film, the family is the protagonist. Um, so that, that was a big element of figuring out what the cast should be was like really piecing together each individual element, making sure it's gonna fit together. Um, so Steven, Yeti, and uh, YJ, they, they just really seemed like they'd be perfect. And then finding those kids, that was the tricky part. Um, I, I came back. Yeah, talk I about think, that a bit. That, that I want to hear about. Oh, that was, that was the part that was, uh, I don't know, Steve, <laughs> it was, it was kind, of, kind of stressful because we, we only had maybe a month to do this. And we, we had a casting director named Julia Kim, who she's Korean, uh, Korean American, and she sent out all these flyers and, and notices to churches, all these different uh, Korean organizations. And, and we had about 90 tapes sent to us. And uh, we're just so fortunate to have found Alan and Noel. I mean, to not only find kids who are fluent in both languages, but also the talent that they innately have. I mean, that was, um, yeah, that was a miracle for me. Uh, Steven actually love, came like, in. Okay. Oh no, St uh, Stephen came in for a, an audition with Alan as well at the mm -hmm. Plant B office, and that was so fun. And uh, yeah. it was almost instant that we knew, okay, this kid's special and he's got something. He's so present and pure and true. Um, yeah. He was both of them. Um, you can't lie to them in the scene, and so it keeps you honest as an actor too. Mm -hmm. So it was like it was awesome. I also love like the just there was something like that 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 moment when Alan's walking in. Uh, to see the grandmother and, and she asks like, oh, is he the one that looks like me? And and there's just something about like, it, it's so natural that like, again, it, it feels like it's a, a camera in someone's <clears throat> home in this moment. I mean, it was just, there was something just was so beautiful about that little, that moment. I just thought it was, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. And I, those kids are 
amazing. I know how hard it is to work with kids. Was there anything that you did to, I know that you said you had precious little time, but was there anything that you did to kind of take the stress off of them or make the thing feel as familial as it felt? Um, I, I mean, a, a key thing was that all the actors were in on it, where they, they wanted to create the atmosphere of a family. And um, on and off the camera, they, they were all so giving and creating that sort of reality uh, where we were filming. And th that was really key. Um, and, and it helped the kids stay in character basically throughout the shoot. Um, we, we, we just tried to make sure to uh, tune the production according to what's gonna help them succeed the most, the kids. Yeah. Uh, because the other actors, I mean, they're they're such pros that they were able to go with whatever we needed to do. Whether, you know, it's the, whether we focus all our coverage on the kids in the beginning, mm -hmm. or you know, whatever we needed to do to make it work. Um, and by the so, way, yeah, Will, Will Patton for the Will Patton for the win. I mean, holy cow, oh, that guy! Man. He <laughs> so is so off good. the charts, amazing. Um, because the this because the movie has such an effortless feel to it, it's easy to take for granted a lot of the work that was done, the production design and, and the photography, um, and certainly the, the score, which I, that was like the first thing that struck me. I think I reached out to the composer like immediately because I was just so so struck. Can you talk a little bit about your collaboration with, with Emil and, and some of the others? Oh yeah, uh, with Emil, that was great because he, he really liked, he really loved the script and he, he sent me music before I started production. Um, so I was able to, like he, he sent me the this suite, the Minari suite, and it, it, when you find it on the album, it's not changed from what he's, he wrote. And he told wow. me, this is just a sketch. And, and I listened to it, I was just blown away. I can't believe this is a sketch. It's um, beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. And I listened to that every day uh, to the point that I just felt like the film really internalized the music. And, and, uh, you know, the, and I felt like the music really has the film within it. Um, and, and he's just, he's, he's a genius, he's brilliant. Mm. And those other people and, you mentioned, the production yeah. designer, the DP, you know, Young Oak Lee and, and Lachlan Milne. I mean, they were just so perfect for this as well. Um, can you just talk a little bit about, about Minati and, and what's so special about it and in, in both Korean culture and what it represents uh, for you? Um, sure, I mean, on a personal level, um, my grandma really did plant Minati in this creek uh, below this pond at our house and uh, my parents were always at work and um, I, I would go down to the creek with my grandma there were lots of snakes and that's that's something that shows up in the film and I, I would sing songs about Minari as she would grow grow these plants um, by the time that we sold the the farm uh, my dad made this remark that it's interesting that the only plant that seemed to really grow on this land was that Minari that your grandma brought and um, that always stuck with me as something very poetic and deep. And because I remember that it was a plant that we didn't put too much effort into, yet my dad and the farming, that took a lot of effort. That was a struggle. And it, it spoke a lot to maybe the way that my grandma lived her life and, and the, the principles that she had. In mm. real life, uh, I, I did some research as I was writing the script and I did find out some things that were interesting to the story that um, it's usually not the first harvest of the plant, but it's the second that, that really yields the crop that you, mm. you can eat. So the first year you just have to let it die away. And it's the mm. second year that really grows. And that, that feels like the immigrant experience to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there is an element that uh, it seems to uh, make whatever it's planted around clean, like the water becomes cleaner, the dirt becomes cleaner. Um, so yeah, it's just a poetic plant. Um, wow, um, that's amazing. And and Stephen, just the scenes between you uh, and Yeti are so are so uh, fraught and so honest. And I know that you spoke earlier about just sort of submitting to this story and going with it. And and I know that talking about acting, like talking about writing sometimes is like vaguely pointless because it's sort of, it's what you do. And I know it's, it's a little weird, but I just was curious if there was anything you could speak of to talk about like how you, how you found that resonance and that truth in, in scenes with her. I mean, she's spectacular in the movie as well. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious what your experience was working with her. 
She's incredible. I think um, she's also uh, pure in that way. Um, I, th I think I think what was really great that I ha I have to say is Isaac really cast this film beautifully, and he really set up a framework by which he didn't bring in uh, he brought in the right people, not just um, skill and maybe character fit, but also um, all across the board people that were really willing to just let go and submit to a film like this. Um, to not necessarily try to poke their head a little higher and say like, you, you know, like let their egos take the best of them, but rather like everyone just really locked in and serviced whatever was was being asked of them. And I think that was very evident from the very beginning. And so, um, you know, it really did feel like a family. It really did feel like a, a, a lost marriage, it, it, a potentially lost marriage. It, it mm -hmm. felt like um, real because... I think we're all kind of collectively holding these truths for each other um, throughout the course of this short while that we made it down to the point that like, you know, what was really cool about um, everyone that I worked with, but spe specifically Yeti was, you know, we had a couple of those scenes that were like single takes and it wasn't necessarily because we had no time. It was also because Isaac's wise and, and bold enough to be like, we got it. And um, he didn't even over, he didn't even, you know, over block things. He just said, I think I want to put the camera right here. And then we would just find our natural spots and then just do the scene. And then Isaac was like, cool, we got it. And I was like, are you sure? And then we just move <laughs> on. And, you know, that's like a wisdom that, you know, like that, I don't know how he, he's so great. And so with Yeti, like there was just like an un, we didn't, we didn't rehearse. We didn't over talk about things. The only thing that we talked about between her and I was, does this seem true to both of us? And do we need to work some of the words to feel more honest about how we want to say things or what we want, or what we're intending to say? And what was really cool about like the initial um, sketching of these characters together was, I would come in with my understanding of what I think the relationship is and she would come back with her understanding and the ways in which that we interpreted them differently were so perfect for how Jacob and Monica also see each other and their realities. Mm -hmm. And so I just submitted to that was I was like, oh, I am Jacob because I also am just a dude. And she is Monica because she's a woman and she's carrying this family and can see so many things that I can't see. And right. um, there was actually this really profound moment um, when the barn burned down where, um, you know, as Jacob, as me, as an egotistical, whatever I am uh, at times, uh, I was just like, this is the scene where I just lose it. I'm going to lose it because all my shit's burning. I'm gonna, this is the scene. And uh, the first two takes, you could see me force it so hard. I was like singing in between takes, <laughs> trying to like conjure up emotion. And I think um, a younger me would have definitely just kept trying. Um, but around like the third take, I was like, oh, maybe I should just let go and see what happens. And I let go and I just went with it. And no tears came out, just result just like what just I was just watching it and then I look over and I see Yeti and she's just sobbing like for the third take in a row just just pouring out all the pain and tension and love that she as Monica had been holding for the family the entire time and that was like as me myself I was like oh I need to realize this for my own life <laughs> like I need to look at, I need to go thank my wife and like, I need to go thank my mom. And um, wow. it was awesome. that, it was, it was people were honest and, and truthful. Mm. That's amazing. But um, before we, we wrap up, I was just curious, um, Isaac, if there was anything that came from this experience that you didn't expect that surprised you along the way? Mm. Uh, everything about it is somehow a surprise. I mean, just to come through it uh, in the way that we did and in, in the amount of time that we did, uh, I, 
I kept, I told my wife as we were making this, like every day I feel like is a miracle that we're getting through and we're getting what we're getting. Um, maybe, maybe the surprise is what I mentioned to you earlier is to see just how people are connecting to it. Um, mm. It's, it's more than I could have, have hoped for. And it's, it's something that I, I just treat as so precious and um, something that I'm just so grateful for. So um, yeah, it's just that we, we invested in the idea of human beings and to see that, yes, maybe that, that very naive hope that we are all human beings in the end, that that's kind of paying off and we're connecting. Uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, well, you, you've made a, a film, it's a, it's a period film, but it's, it's timeless. And I think it will be an enduring film. And uh, I cannot thank you enough thank you. as uh, an audience member uh, for what you all have made uh, together. It is a, a beautiful work and uh, I congratulate you and uh, thank you. And thanks for this conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, JJ. This was great.